can you all see my slide yes sir it is visible okay friends today we'll talk about this junctional fractures upper 1/4 and lower 3/4 femur junction and uh, somewhere in that region first is this is not so much of a junctional but uh, these are the upper one now here point of entry as we spoke about in all the upper fractures has to be gt it has to be piriform fossa now if in case the things comes from gt then it will go here this will fracture this is what exactly it happened this is how it was and this the point of entry is in gt so it fracture fortunately it held up with the rotational deformity but it held up but then the point of entry has to be in the all the proximal femurs it has to be just in the medial <coughs> just a minute <coughs> It has happened purely because of the fault in surgery. So it should not have happened. If the point of entry was there, and if the if the guide wire or the nail was parallel to the lateral border, then this would not have happened. Okay. Now, yeah, these are the junctional fractures. If the junctional fractures are comminuted here. subtrochanteric fractures at the junction of the ip and the shaft junction now all these things you can see this is also a junctional fracture and then you can see how non union occurs so these are the very 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 unstable fractures surgeon had done initially only the first was only the pfn then he added up this small piggly little plate which is not enough which doesn't give you stability So this is the one. Ultimately, I converted to this, and this held up in two and a half years. So the stability of the fracture. All what I did was I made the fracture stable by this hook plate. So with the treatment order to walk first time better than also with the foot drop. Somebody who had done the osteopathy, the as you can see here, he had done the fibula graft from here. Then he had put in the fibula graft, which obviously got absorbed. Laterally, you put the graft; it does not have much of a value, and so he got a foot drop because of this, and then a non-union. So now that non-union, now I put in the nail again, and I put in the hook plate, and this is the one. After 26 months, we could feel this good amount of talus formation, and fracture healed up. Now, first time we better that also with the foot drop. Good treatment, overkill would be. Make her okay in four months' time by doing the nailing and plating, and probably, probably in this area, you can see this is on day one. This is on day one. So in such a situation, it is impossible to be stable. Only this part of it, proximal part, only this much is not stable. If we put in a plate, would we be think that two plate, two screws will be enough for that? So this is what was the. Surgeon relied on with this sort of a gap. This is where the unstable nail, and also with this gap in the fracture. My treatment on day one will be nail would be nail with the piriform entry and not on the tip of the GT to avoid varus. This is the you can see this is varus, and you can see how the varus was corrected. And this is the perfect valgus because of this point of entry. So treatment is GT and graft, then the medial and supplementary plate. Maybe an overkill, but this is absolutely mandatory. Today I recommend all subtrochanteric fractures with comminution. These fractures primarily 
I have done this plating, nailing and plating. I feel there is no point in just doing the nailing and if it fails, you do it. Because this fracture, only with one screw is not enough. You, even if you can put in one screw there, it's not enough. It is not a stable construct. Unless this bone was intact, then probably it could be. So they are not necessarily stable with nailing alone. I strongly suggest they be treated with nail and adjuvant plate. This may be an overkill, but we are treating a human being. And he and she has to have her own life, not, not only PM of the country, but anybody else to have their own quick, quick relief. Now here, that is the reason on day one, I augmented this. And she became perfectly okay over the time. Now you can see this fracture. Again, one month, you can see, see in the lateral view where everything is haywire. This looks not so bad, but you can see it over here. This is again, it's very unstable with this only, only two screws proximally in the nail. So this, this went into non-union. After five months, you can see this. So after 18 months, this is how it was treated. And this whole thing ultimately held up. In four years' time, it held up very well. So, on day one, I'll augment this with the plate and may or may not graft. Probably this thing, I will not, day one also, I will not hesitate to graft it if it was a situation like this. Commutated junctional fractures are unstable in only nail, more non union charts to overkill and put in a plate. And this is what I did. This is subproc fracture. You can see nail, plate, and the patient are walking about. In three months' time, valgus is maintained and everything is held up very well. Now, this is an orthopedic surgeon's wife from uh, Patna. Operated upon there. Now, you see, once you operated upon this part, it's going to cut off. You can see it is already separated out. So, this separated out. So, the now, the stability is what? Only of this subtrop fracture, stability is only this, which is never going to be. Even if this had not cut out, it was intact. This is not a stable construct. So, this went out and ultimately it was treated the same way. Superb stability, PFN with the, this is the plate, oak plate in nine months' time, it is perfectly held up. So, when I showed this case in a meeting, some commented it should have held up only with a positive reduction on PFN. This is an overkill. When doing second or third surgery, can you take any chances? Overkill is only for the half an hour of surgery. And the patient has no time constraint and also no money in their budget for the first surgery cure after they have chosen the economy package. Most of these patients have already exhausted the money in the first surgery unless they are really super rich. So I feel that in a human being in orthopedics, Non-union, that means four months. Second healing is about six, eight months. So minimum they go through, if you're not careful in the first surgery, is about 12 months, one year, one and a half year. So I think it's too much of a time for anybody's life. So you've got to do everything on day one. Why should there be no overkill in first surgery? He spends four to five months and money for the first surgery. Now here was the patient. 2012. This was the thing and surgeon did the nailing. Now you can see how can this be stable when there is nothing there. This nail is only holding in these two screws. This cannot be a stable and you can see nail is already bent. So now 9-11. This was on 20 June. Started I think See the time goes, you can see. June 12th, uh, June 19th, June 20th, day one, it, it became like this. Now, October, now it is in November, patient did this. One month, second surgery. Five months, second surgery. From this. One year, five months, second surgery. Good fixation was there, but this is, the, this is the area which became necrotic, as you can see. And then you can see the CT scan, which shows the frank non-union. And there it cracked. 
This is the stage patient who has advised surgery, 2814. So you can see now almost two years in two months. One year in nine months, second surgery, two years in two months from the day of injury. Now here it is. He came over after again another so many days. And this is at this stage I said, now don't wait. But they waited and they came up to him. So I operated upon now. I inherited at this stage one year, second month, second surgery, two year, five months after injury. Now, this is how it was. All I did was the same thing. I did the nailing. This was already reconstructed. I removed the necrotic bone, which was already here. This piece has become necrotic. So I removed that, put in the cancellous bone graft after the medial incision. And seven months' time, you can see Hela, good valgus, and everything is held up very well. So you can see surgery, reduction of the fracture, loose dead bone removed. In the middle, in a medial massive graft and a lateral long plane. This was the dead piece which was there. So here, he walked four years after the injury. Now you can imagine that the reason I said if somebody at that age has to wait for four years to walk with all the money in his pocket, and even apart from that, the poor patient can be done. So I think I feel on day one, whenever we operate, with such factors, there is no wrong in doing it. This is what I would have done on day one. I would have done treated on day one to avoid this non union. Reduce this medial loose piece and reverse the piece which is turned 360 degrees without disturbing too much of the soft tissue. Nail it and circle it maybe and add a long adjuvant plate. This is how I would have treated. Put it there, the nail, either here or even two screws, that is fine. I'm it is only diagrammatic, and I would have added a, a plate here in order to give you the stability on day one. And if you need it, you can even graft it after some time, second till four to six weeks, graft it. So at least four to six weeks, if you graft it, it enhances the healing because the first, some, some sort of a reaction has already occurred. You graft it, it will enhance, and it will heal up in about four months' time, which is a normal time for them. Now, here is the fracture. You can see this sort of a comminuted fracture. Only nailing is not enough. And you can see here, there are, there are quite a lot of spit there. So all I added was the, was the plate. And then you can see here in two years time, this is the X-ray he has sent me on that. This is another patient. The whole thing is held up, is walking about and moving about. So I think every time you do this sort of a comminuted pieces, now here is the fracture. This is only one and a half month, and you can see it has gone here. This is no future. So this needs surgery. This is the one which is scheduled in next week. So here now, junctional fracture femur, upper two-third and lower one. Fractures over here. We have spoken about it, but I'll go again into this. This is one and a half year, it has, it has become like this. And then all what they come, this is a orthopedic surgeon's wife. She has still been a gynecologist. And you can see this is Dr. Kavita Kumar from Bhopal. Yeah. If you treat it properly, everything heals up. In this sort of a fracture, on day one, this is not the treatment. Walked after 24 months. Also, many surgeons' wife, so obviously, treatment by the best person in the city. Now, this is very notorious in a lower one third fracture. Basically, there is no hole, so it goes on swaying, and you will go on losing this bone. This is what is a notorious picture. Now, as you can see here, this was a young lady, day one operation. You can see that this is the screw. It was not healing up. So, you can see here what has happened. CT scan, this is the nail, and you can see this, this expanding cavity. The nail is almost floating there. Nail is a decent hole there. Now, the nail hole is becoming poorer, and this there is almost in the this the fragment, there is no hold of the nail. You can see it here clearly. So once this happens, you know this is not going to help. So you have to be careful. That do not just leave it like this. The option to me is do a digital female nail. If you do a digital female nail, then take a good hold of this, this nail, and you can see the fracture hits up. This nail is a support alone. So support alone is first is a very good hole. 
and there is a spiral blade and the screw and this is very good proximally is a very good thing so primarily option in such juncture fracture is the best femur nail in a subcondral which is the yes and the best fixation which is enhanced by two or three screws so now you can have three four screws in the distal fat and you can see there is a good hole here or a terminated section like this Anything with nail is not a good fixation. So I enhance it on day one, and then you can see whole thing is up completely. So do not just try to take it for granted. Then it will heal up just because you did. This sort of a fracture is not stable. A fracture I would not have done anything. Now this fracture. Because with these three screws also, it went into non-union. Anti grade with two screws and three screws, multi screw in a different direction, and push nail subcondral is thought to be better. But if this anti grade nail never goes subcondral, so even with these three screws, it is going to be a problem. So it goes into non-union. Again, the treatment is very simple. This is non-union. This is established non-union. Go down on the medial side. The healing is going to happen on the medial side. The osteoblast are on the medial side. So that that is the one when you do this grafting in the medial side and a jewel plate, and you can see things heal up. This is after removing the nail, and this is what I call it a medial side. This is the incision. You see it on the bone, and take here is the bone entry. So you take an incision just on the bone. You go there and bone go straight on the bone. Now we call it at anterior medial. Medial and posterior medial. Posterior medial will be little, but still you will be able to decorticate it. And then put in a graft there. This is what I have mentioned. You put in a big graft on the medial side. The graft, if you put a bone graft on the lateral side, it doesn't heal up. You need the bone graft on the medial side, and this heals up, and this is perfectly all. Everything heals up. So here. Few people recommend anti-grade multi-axial multi-screws in. Is the end. If anti grade, this may be better option, but not necessarily the best. If you know, the some people have the experience anti grade nail with four screws distally in a different direction is good enough for fixation. I feel it is better chance, but still is not hundred percent. So even if you declare like this, is going to not be. So this is the situation. Ten years. Three operations, still non-union. So I would suggest is go down, fix it up. Then this is the way. Kamita Kumar, for from the days childhood osteomyelitis. I told you that this is the. You can see here all this is the old arterial fracture or or arterial problem. This is the one which is done, and in seven years time, the whole thing is perfectly healed up. So this is again Dr. Sachdev from Delhi. Husband is an orthopedist. Why I am trying to show this? That these are treated adequately by the best of the people in that area. This was the fracture, double fracture. Nailing is a perfect treatment. This on day one, I would have, I would have put in the adjuvant plate. Here you could have put in three screws or four screws, which could have been all right, but not necessarily it is the ideal situation. So this went into non-union five months. Again, a plate graft, and ultimately six months time it healed up. This is already healed up. This is healed up. Now again, this sort of a fractures. So surgeon did a lateral graft. Lateral grafting is no use. You can see this was day one. This is what they did the dynamization. Lateral grafting is no use. This is not a stable construct. So only lateral grafting is not enough. So yeah, out of these two screws, he one did one into dynamic hole. You can just see he removed the one screw and he kept the dynamic hole and changed this thing. Till I went into non-union and this is the same one which I talked about. So junctional fractures, upper two third and lower one third, or upper three fourth and lower one fourth. All these are the ones which I mentioned. They need this to be treated. All this has come again.
Now this is the nail. This is the nail. Digital femur nail with four screws distally. If the fracture is there, you can put four screws and this will be perfectly all right. Sorry, I think this is a, this is a repetition. Now, this is the case. I have shown you this already. This is the patient. This is the Maharani of a one stage. Since the total knee was done by a joint replacement surgeon with this fracture, they went to a joint replacement who did the nailing from proximal to screw. This is the poor culprit, as you know very well. Just a minute. Yes, Sachim, I am on the teaching schedule. Anything urgent? So th this doesn't work, and this you can see it ended up into the bad non-union because these two screws here so near is not enough situation. So ultimately, long plate, medial graft, and these three, four screws and a medial graft, and th this is the one which is done. This is on day one. If it was supplemented with the plate, it would have been perfectly all right. It would have been done very well. Day one, this edual plate would have saved this baran. Now we come to the lower one third femur. Now this is other. Dr. Gadigune, are you there? Dr. Gadigune? Can you all hear me or you can't hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Yes, Just that the audio is not very good. But now it's okay. Dr. Gadigun, are you there? The net Asim. is not very straight. Asim, are you yeah. there? Yeah, I am there and I can see your screen and the presentation also, but the voice is little breaking because probably the net is not very... Yeah, Good. it is the reason I am I am I am seeing yes. those circles. It's a bit of so, I, yeah. so you so I would suggest you take over and you show your cases. Uh, Hello. Are you the there? The problem is here. I am. Yeah. Yes, sir. So you can you take over? Yeah, I will just try. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Yeah. This, is, this was the lower third fracture tibia in a young male patient. He was seen by residents in the casualty and then posted for surgery. Uh, X-rays were not very brilliant. That was almost 15, 20, 15 years back. So patient was taken up for tibia nailing. And this is the intro picture. And at this stage, I realized that there is a significant posterior malleolar fracture. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible in the first actor also. Okay. It is seen as yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. it is seen in the first actor also. Yeah, it is seen, but it was missed basically. Okay. Okay, carry on. Yeah. I should have got dedicated X-ray of the proximal and the distal joint. So, the dictum not followed. Uh, that was the position with the nail there. So, we were helpless. We continued with the nailing and then turned the patient, posterolateral approach, plated the fibula, uh, reduced posterior first, plated it, anti-glide plate, 
plated the fibula and this is now almost 16 17 years he is still having an excellent mental function so that was the advantage of keeping everything on table auto cleared all the time ready so that was my first exposure to this combination of injury another patient here something was probably suspicious in the talus there she had a lot of tenderness around that area so uh, and very educated and intelligent patient so an mri was ordered so mri did not show anything in the talus it showed a posterior malleolar fracture though in good position slight little widening but nothing much but it was there and that changed the whole yeah, I'll go back. Okay. Still, can you go back there is one? The still, can you still go back one? This fracture is. Yes. No, 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 no. New, new. Yes. <laughs> next, next. Yeah, this is the. Yeah, just wait there. Yeah. You wanted to draw something there? No, you carry on. You carry on. Hello? You carry on. Yes, sir. So, we nailed the tibia because the posterior malware yeah, in this place, so we uh, fixed the posterior malus with leg screw there and plated the fibula because it's a very lower down fracture and it went on to heal uneventfully. Ah, yes, I know the lady, she's doing great. So, if you review the literature, uh, Helfred published a series of 25 patients, spiral fracture of the distal third of tibia, x rays, CT scan. And MRI was done for all these patients. Ankle injury could be detected in about 84% of these spiral third, distal third uh, tibia fractures. X-rays could detect this combination of injury in only 20%. CT scan could detect in 56%. And MRI was able to detect in 64%. Another paper from Predictive radiographic markers for concomitant ipsilateral injuries in CT scan were taken in all the patients. 50% had associated ankle injury. 60% of the distal third fracture tibia had ankle injury. So if you go to the middle third and the proximal third, the association of ankle injury is less common. 90% of these fractures fractures occurred in a spiral distal third fracture of the tibia. So if you've got a spiral distal third fracture, you are more likely to have an associated ankle injury. Same is not true for a transverse fracture. Fibular fracture had no correlation. Out of these patients having ankle injury with tibia fracture, 50% had involvement of posterior malleolus, 10% had anterior tibia fibular telox fracture, 6% involved medial malleolus and 30% had a combination injury. X-rays unfortunately missed 80% of these ipsilateral ankle injuries. If you look at the incidence of posterior malleolar fracture in a spiral distal third tibia, a paper by Sirkin in 2018 GOT tells us 193 patients, X-rays and CT scan both done, spiral fracture distal tibia, 92% patients had posterior malleolar fracture. Non-spiral fracture, only 4% had ankle injury. That's important. 50% of these injuries were missed on X-rays initially. So at the slightest suspicion, you should order a thin slice, 2 mm slice ankle CT. So ipsilateral ankle injury is the rule with spiral fracture of distal third tibia rather than exception. Now, how to treat it? Displaced posterior malleolar fracture during intramedullary as happened in our case, and all, 
all these four patients in which posterior malleolus fracture was there, they all required second surgery because initially it couldn't be fixed. So, recognition is extremely important. Before you take the patient for nailing, decrease the need for open reduction. You yeah. must stress every ankle fracture of distal third of tibia after patient and do an anterior drawer also. Change post -op mobilization program and the wet bearing as and when required because if there is an joint there, fracture line extending into the ankle, obviously the wet bearing is out for almost six to eight weeks, whatever you do. Posterior malleolar fracture associated with a tibia fracture. More than 1,000 patients. Tornata published this large series in 2016. He recommended that articular reduction should be done first. If you do that and then go to the shaft, incidence of reduction is only 2%. If you nail the tibia first and then go to the joint, incidence of malunion is 44%. So the recommendation was reduce joint first and then nail. Uh, this is one of those rare incidences where I don't follow the book recommendation. At least eight or nine patients I can remember where there was an associated ankle with tibia distal third fracture and I, every time I have chosen to nail the tibia first and then go to the joint. Uh, another paper by Ramel, Direct open reduction by posterior approach is far more stable than indirect reduction of posterior malleolus and anteroposterior fixation. We are all familiar with that. AP screw versus posterior lateral plate for posterior malleolar fixation in trimalleolar fracture, as you can see there, the functional results and the range of motion and everything, every outcome is far superior if you open reduce the posterior malleolus. It's far superior with a posterior lateral plate than AP screw alone. That's all. Sir, any questions? Sir, I want to ask, sir. Yes, sir. Bolie. Sir, you always recommend to nail the tibia first and then go for the posterior malleolus or what do you recommend, sir? I quoted the literature. Literature says that you do it other way around, but uh, uh, every time I have done it, I never regret it. Rather, uh, I can share some tips. Reduce the shaft perfectly. Don't compromise. Somebody has posted in the group some... Uh, distal third comminuted tibia. So I think that's not a very uh, meticulous surgery. That spiral lying on the medial side should be clamped and hold. Uh, you hold it with the multiple two or three percutaneous clamps reduced all through the surgery. Then you pass the nail. At times you may be choosing a nail a centimeter or so short so that it doesn't disturb your ankle reduction. Proximally lock it. Distally there are four locking options available, at least pass two. And for the third one, you pass a guide wire, K wire, thick K wire and hold it there. So that because once you reduce the ankle and put a plate there, it's virtually impossible to put the locking bolts in the dissertation. That is the problem. So you have to keep an eye on the ankle reduction all the time. You can't keep your ankle mal reduced. So, entire shaft and the ankle should be kept well reduced, maybe temporarily held with K wires and the clamps. And I'll go to nail the tibia first and pass at least two locking bolts and the third one at least K wire there, thick K wire over which I can pass my bolt. Then I'll go to the ankle and open reduce it from behind. Sir, what is your implant of choice for that posterior malleolus? In the anti-glide plate, I will try to pass over that guide wire, which is coming uh, from maybe from front. Yes, sir. Boli, Boli, sir. Sir, what is your sir? What is your implant of choice for that uh, posterior malleolus, sir? 
always an open reduction. If fragment is big, then an anti glide plate. Usually, it's a distal third T gap plate. Uh, dist distal uh, radius, usually. Sir, you, you, put the, a recon plate. you put the screw across the fracture side, or you just put the screw proximally at the tip of the fracture? No, I, I fix the distal fragment also. Okay. See, I think basically... I want to complete basically, how to fix post-GM LLS. See, basically... I'll make a post -GM. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, we will love to listen to from you. Yes, sir. Yes. Basically, Asim, I am talking. Can I? Asim, can I talk? Ah, yes, sir. Basically, post yes, yes, sir. Yes. Basically, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear yes, me? Sir. Yes, we can hear you. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Basically, posterior malleolus needs a screw fixation if it is a small piece, but if it is a large piece, always a buttress plate. Now, the question was it is a large piece, only the buttress plate, or you put a screw also through the lower fragment. Buttress plate is the one which does the job, but if it is a large piece, only buttress plate is not reliable. So you put in the screws from the distal fragment also, and if possible, you can put in a leg screw there, through the plate or outside the plate, whichever is convenient. But the screws, you will have to put it in the distal fragment. Because you are choosing a buttress plate only into the larger fragment if there is a portion I usually, if it's a large fragment, I usually pass two screws in the distal fragment. One, first one is a leg screw for the interarticular compression, and second one is usually a locking bolt. And then maybe one or two screws in the metaphysical part. Myra. Any other questions to everything what we have spoken, or me have spoken, and Dr. Asim has spoken? Sir. 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 I got a PPT on the steps of this uh, fixation of posterior malleolus and clamping it and other things. There are beautiful intro slides. I'll make a PDF and send in the group. No, no, you speak here. That's not the problem. If you want no, to speak, I, I, I have not loaded it. So I'll, yeah. Okay, then I, I and any other questions up till now what we spoke? I think Dr. Gani is fine. India, out if I can. We'll see it at some stage today. Uh, excuse me, sir. Can I can I ask a question, please? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yeah. In in one of the studies quoted by Asim, sir, it was shown that MRI has higher uh, sensitivity in picking up the posterior malleolus fracture uh, rather than CT. Yes. Uh, uh, why yeah. could it be? Sir? If you are, that is the rule of thumb everywhere. If you are looking for hunting for a fracture, scaphoid or uh, uh, posterior malleus or any fracture, if there is a suspicion and you are hunting for it, you shouldn't ask for a CT, you should ask for a MRI. MRI negative is foolproof. If there is no intima seen that, the fallacy of MRI is that it may overshow it. In some patients, there is no significant fracture, but still you will get edema because of bone confusion. Can okay. I, can I... MRI is hundred percent foolproof for a scaphoid. Yes. Can I just can I just interrupt? See, I think the question is very valid. Yeah. Majority of us for a posterior malleolus, we ask for a CT scan where we will be able to judge. Where is the fracture into medially, laterally, into that uh, into the sagittal uh, section? What Asim is saying is, if there is a fracture, which is incipient fracture, which so many times we have picked up in the neck of the femur, or sometimes into the alendronate fracture, then the MRI will be able to show you the signals which are not seen in the CT scan. But if it is a fracture which is obvious, CT will show to, to the common eye, CT will show much better. But I must also ex accept here, Dr. Asim, 
is very very comfortable with yes, MRI and he can interrupt MRI like any of the professionals. So he is very very good at MRI and he he does it majority of the time he does MRI. But for we mortals who are not that good, CT scan can be more informative to us. But I agree, sir, I think MRI will give you the whole information about the bone, the ligament, the tendons and everything. Yes, Asim, you want to add up anything? No, sir, I'm just looking for the, I had sent you a PPT of a step. So I'm just looking for that PPT if I find out. Then I will show it sometime. I'll just inform you. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my slide? Interlocking has now become standard yeah. surgery. Can you see that? Can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. We can yes, see. Sir. Your screen is seen. Okay. The interlocking now has become a standard surgery. Still, many complications are there in decision making of the nailing. As we spoke about the proximal femur and the distal femur, everyone knows how to nail and how to do the proximal and distal locking. So there is nothing new in it. I tell you, when we started interlocking, main focus was on interlocking the holes. Just trying to put the screws inside, how to do it. But now that is not the issue at all. Now the whole game is, don't, the execution of the nailing is not the game. The whole game is in, in making that decision of locking the nail. How many screws, where, and if nail or plate or whatever needs to be done. So it is the decision making which is the main thing which is there to be done. I'm presuming that a good reduction is mandatory before nailing. There is no two, two points about it. And if no good reduction, nailing is a failure. Even if fracture heals due to malunion, but still it's not a good treatment. Now, upper end of the tibia, there are new thoughts on nailing of the proximal tibia. Lateral entry point, proximal most entry point, semi-extended position of nailing, posterior most entry point. You can even people have gone intra intra joint and go just just behind, just in front of the ACL structure insertion, so that you will be into the main line. You will be able to go there. Polar <coughs> screws. And now everything has been super now superseded by suprapatellar entry of the nail. <coughs> Dr. Garigune will be talking about the suprapatellar entry of the nail. So for proximal tibia, suprapatellar entry of the nail has given us a very good reduction site. Now here is the polar screw which you do it. This is help redirection, which all of you know. We won't go into detail. Now you see, these are some of the experts' trends. I requested some examples, and I presented them and, and later and analyzed. This proximal tibia, this is not a suprapatellar entry. This is a proximal entry. And you can see the entry, and the thing is held up. The actual is held up. You can see this one. The, on the medial side, there is the some amount of a... Compression, which is there, you can see it over here. Probably this is there from the beginning, but you can don't see it here, which you see it post-operatively. So there is some malalignment might have happened intraoperatively. Now here you can see that is this is pre-op and this is post-op. Now this is the pre-op. This is a mid-pop I feel this is not anything inferior to the nailing. The nailers will say, we'll nail this. Because they take pride in nailing. So they are good in nailing. This is the same nipo plating you can do it. And the whole thing completely becomes all right. Or you can see this fracture, a nipo plating. And you, and you will be able to get a perfect anatomy restoration. And this will be fine. While you can see the nailing, there are many complications before the suprapatellar nail came in. So the suprapatellar nail has changed the whole picture again. Because I think the nailing, which was done earlier into the proximal fragment, this malunion was the norm rather than the exception. But now it's a different ballgame, as I'm saying. But this is the good option. This is in 2005, you can understand. This sort of a comminuted fracture, or what you do is a nail uh, plate, 12 years post-op, full 
everything is maintained. There is just no 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 question of anything at all. Very well, everything is done. As you can see, this is eight months and twelve months also the whole thing is maintained. The oblique fracture and the rotation, I think I consider these fractures are different than the transverse fractures. These fractures, even in a nail, they are comparatively unstable. But as I as I said, Dr. Garigune will be able to show beautifully how he does Supra Patel the nail and he changes the whole story altogether. The oblique fracture, rotational deformity, perfect anatomy distortion is always a perfect result. Try nailing. If you cannot get it, change over to plating. Do not your ego come in the way. I think what is happening is the nailers have put in that ego. It's a difficult operation and we can do it and why you can't do it. So it is like this, as I said, this is one of the one of the excellent surgeons. I know him very well. At the end of the whole operation, corner screws and everything, so many options to put it in the proximal fragment, the real proximal point of entry, till he ended up into this. I wish at one stage, here was the fracture. This would have been easily plated and the thing would have been perfectly all right because it didn't need anything to be done. You can see beautifully, you can put in a plate and the thing would have been perfectly all right. But this is what he ended up into. So my thing is, if you are a good nailer, go ahead and do a nailing. But nailing is not mandatory. To me, this can easily be treated with the plate. With all these blocks, through still not anatomical all the time. Now here you can see that this is the one you treat it with the plate and things become perfectly normal. Now here is the nail. Still, it doesn't give you that stability. This has gone into non-union, which is salvaged by the plate. The supra patella point of entry, this is the one where you go above the patella, so your point of entry is in the line and the reduction and everything is very good. I think we'll see this by Dr. Garigun as of, uh, the presentation, which is beautiful. And this is semi-extended position. So the fracture reduction and everything is very well seen. You can see the way the nail comes here and the proximal fragments lay down very well. But again in this long oblique, fractures have their own situations, which probably we'll talk about. Proximal tibia fractures are hard to name, even with experience and admitted Paul Tornetto. Paul Tornetto is today considered to be the uh, main important surgeon in the world. If you get the perfect portal and the proper trajectory, nailing extension and the use of a blocking screw, then only nailing is okay. This is the another thing by extra, extra article of proximity via fractures treatment with intramedullary nail versus plate fixation. Roma direction and this, this, this. Now, this is the one, there was no difference in the rates of non union of either treatment. Treated by intramedullary nailing experience, more malunions or compartments in Rome than those treated with plating. Implant failure occurred only in patients treated by intramedullary nailing. However, definitive conclusion cannot be drawn from this collection of case series. The incidence of mal reduction associated with the intramedullary nailing is substantially decreased with the use of a new technique and reduction agent, such as blocking screws, temporary plating. Now, this temporary plating is the easiest thing which any, anyone who is not very much used to go down and put in a temporary plate on the proximal tibia fracture. Now nail it. You may remove the nail plate or you keep the plate. It is your situation. Universal distractor in semi-extended position. In several small retrospective studies with a total of 183 patients treated with nailing using one or more of this technique, the reported mild reduction rate ranged from 0 to 15.5% with an average of 8.2. So mild reduction is a major complication of this proximal tibia factor. Somebody upstairs had a pity on the average surgeon like me and introduced a loppy plate as a treatment of this complex upper tibia. What is the problem with the interlocker? If we can get this easier surgery with no special skill, Doris says they call themselves, it is a sacrilege if you do not do nailing of all these fractures with multiple blocking through 
for a polar screw as they call it. And difficult implant, and we surgeons like to flaunt our skills. And difficult implant operations we can execute well, it is a better if with the perfect restoration. Interlocals would like to call these factors in this category. It must be made. Or like me, how I flaunt 95 degree plate plate as a better implant because I can execute it better. And, and really ridicule those who use DCF. I am also in the same group. Attend every educative nail score meeting, but do the plating if it gives the better results in your hand. If you are not a good nailer, do not feel that you have to do the bad nailing as I showed you. Plating is a much simpler operation and in that proximal tibia, in a, meta, in a metaphysical area, non-union is not the situation. You do the nailing, if possible, MIPO, if not possible, open nailing, oh, sorry, open plating, it doesn't give you non-union. Nailing, I, have, I accept, if you can execute a good nailing, it's a good treatment, there is no question. Plating, major issue is, if in case there is an edema and swelling, which is there into the proximal tibia fractures, then nailing is a much better option than plating. But if the fracture is not badly, is not a high velocity injury, then if you can do the operation on day one or day two, then the plating will also give you equally good result. But if the skin is the problem, there is no option except a navy. Dr. Nirmal Tejwani from Boston, there is a limited clinical evidence to show a clear advantage with plating or nailing of the proximal tibia fractures. Both options remain valid. Surgeons familiarity with the technical aspects of each approach Implant limitation and soft tissue factors may be contributory in decision making process. Now, as you can see, if you've done the nailing in this fracture, this is a non union which is so predominant. Unfortunately, the surgeon has already missed the uh, locking screws. The interlocking may give you good results, often it may not be perfect. And the perfect restoration of anatomy assures a perfect result. If one has the skill of this other faculty here, one must do polar screw and nail and hope minor axis variation does not occur. If one is an average surgeon and too busy about, too fussy about the final result, change over to plating in time and relax. So even if you start nailing for proximal tibia fractures, you must keep the nailing. Because you must keep the plating. And that way you'll be rewarded. Even in trap, you can change over. There is, there is no shame in changing over that. Attend every educative meeting and give a better result. And this is what he will say. If you are a good nailer, nail it. If you are like me, fussy, about the final result, I feel nail or plate, if you can give the best final result, that is the best thing which you can do. The junction of the upper two-third and lower one-third tibia. Now we'll come to anybody. Anybody wants to talk about this proximal tibia? Dr. Garigune, are you there? Yes, sir. I am ready. Good, 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 good. good, good. So now so, uh, I... Yeah. We will discuss about this and then we will go for it. Chandak has also joined. So, very good, very uh, good. So we'll now I want, you to, I want you to talk about uh, 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 Supra Patel. Supra Patel. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any questions? Any questions about what I have spoken just now? Okay, Garigune, you can you take it over. Uh, yes, sir. Chandok, what do you have? Do you have anything to present? Or oh, cases? I can't hear you. You, you, are, you are muted. I have uh, one or two cases. Yeah, certainly. Most certainly. Yeah, yeah. So after Gadi Gune, yes. you please present. I found out that sequence of fixation of posterior mandibular yeah. about it. So there are not many slides. We'll just see that part only.
So am I visible, sir? Yes, you are. So good evening, sir. Respected Tanna sir, Sadak ji, Asim Negi, and all participants. <coughs> I am going to tell you something, a new story about a suprapatellar nailing of TBL fracture. There is nothing new. It is already in the circulation in the Western world also. But in, the, in India, it is now uh, two, three years. Uh, mm -hmm. They have started doing this a suprapatellar nailing. So TBL fracture, as uh, Tarnasar said, mostly high energy trauma, bumper strike, motor vehicular accidents, sports injury, high incidence of neurovascular and open injury, and low threshold for compartmental syndrome. So most accepted method in a proximal tibia, and still it is supposed to be a gold standard, is the plate. Maybe a compression plate, bridge plate, locking plate, or anything of its kind, depending on the configuration of the fracture. And uh, you can see here, whereas malunion, nonunion, and you can see if the proper precaution of the soft tissue is not taken care, we may get a exposed plate. So this is not the fault of the plate, but it is the fault of a a surgeon who is taking the decision. And you must know in the proximal tibia, there is an internal degluing of the soft tissues which is not revealed visually. And you know, don't know what is the amount of uh, internal uh, degluing is there in the soft tissue. Therefore, please, whether you do a nailing or plating, be cautious for uh, going ahead with the surgery. Otherwise, you may have done a very good surgery, but you may land into the problem. So, direct I surgery. Sir. Yes, I sir. Wonder if I can ask you. Yes, sir. If, if there is an internal degrowing as you picture, does the bleeding, and I entirely agree that bleeding is what I going to But the bleeding, does that also increase the chance of So, Sir, you are not audible. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. In the, if there is a degluing. Yes, sir. If there is a degluing, and I, I entirely agree with the degluing, internal degluing, plating is contraindicated. There is no question about it. But what I am asking is whether the daily does it increase the chances of infection if there is an internal degluing, which is a massive, a massive thing which has happened inside? Yes, sir. Among the two, among the two, nailing is the better option. There is no issue. So what I am asking is whether even nailing we should hold on or we can go ahead and do it as early as possible. Yes, as, uh, you may say I am a conservative surgeon, but I will hold it on for some time because there is no hurry in doing a surgery. An internal fixation is not our goal only. It is the ultimate success is the goal. So whatever you do, you do a reaming and everything, probably internal degluing and there is a leakage and seepage of the blood from the reaming product and your inside pressure also increases the chances of compartmental syndrome. And therefore, I think one should wait till the soft C2 uh, insult subsides. Probably in the plating, we'll have to wait for some more time rather than plating for some time, lesser time for the nailing as compared to the plating. But don't go for a very emergency surgery unless it is a compound fracture and where it needs a uh, reduction and fixation by external fixation or by nailing as the case indicated. That is my view. What about Chandak, sir? What is your view? <coughs> Rightly said, uh, what Sir is asking is whether the uh, nail also is going to increase the rate of infection. I think the rate of infection would be higher in both these series, almost. No, plating, I think, is out of question, except wait yeah. for a long time. is out yeah. of question. I am talking about the nailing only. So as, oh. as very rightly, Gary could have mentioned, even nail also, you delay till the time the, some, some healing has occurred of, the, of that, and then only go and do a nailing. Otherwise, even nailing can get infected. Yeah, so it would it would require soft tissue optimization first. 
by whatever means. means. Yeah, whatever means. Yes, yes. yes. And I will go a stage further. If there is an internal degrowing, what you are describing, probably even later stage also, plating is going to be far more hazardous than the Navy. Yes. So, direct surgery into the region would further damage the precarious blood supply. Complications and prognosis are directly related to the degree of soft tissue injury. Whether you do a plating, or nailing, and therefore, if at all, if it is possible for you and if you are able to reduce the fracture, bypass the precarious zone by nail. So don't give an external incision, and probably you can do a fixation of the uh, fracture by a nail. So this is the philosophy behind it. So what are the challenges of nailing in a proximal and segmental and distant tibial fracture? It is a mild medullary space, small, unstable fragments. Just passing a nail does not reduce the fracture at within the diaphysis. And intra-articular extensions are very common in such a type of injuries. Catastrophes of improper technique, as Dr. Tarnasar has already suggested, you get all varieties of deformities, vulgus, varus, procurvatum, you can get a shortening and so many other complications. Only the nail is inside, fixation in the side, but functionally the patients, they are very, very poor. And if at all this fracture unites, it unites in a mal position, which is very disastrous to the patient or throughout uh, disability. So a technical error, if you pass a very low entry point in a proximal tibia, you will find that there is a nail force posteriorly because of the high Herzog weight, and then you will get a procurvatum deformity. If you pass a nail through a normal entry point of medial to the medial tibial spine, as you do in a infrapatellar approach, two medial entry point will produce a vulgus deformity because of the translation of the proximal fragment towards the medial size and taking the nail path of the least resistance on the lateral side. So nail force laterally. So these are the common things which happens already. It is described by Tarnasar that if you don't do a proper nailing, these things are routinely observed. Classical infrapatellar nailing with knee flex to 90 degree leads to predictable deformities. That is apex anterior because of the quadriceps force. Posterior translation of a distal fragment because of the gravity and vulgus alignment of the fracture because of the wrong entry point. So these are the classical things which you see after infrapatellar nailing in a uh, infrapatellar nailing in a proximal tibial fracture, and the mal union rate is described in literature up to 38 to 43 percent. And one of the author has written that whether the proximal tibial nailing should be an absolute for the treatment of the proximal tibia by infrapatellar approach. So nailing in a metaphyseal fracture then, therefore, to summarize the issues, issues are deforming forces of muscles, entry point issues, and placement of the nail. These are the three issues they are most concerned to the orthopedic surgeons while performing a perfect surgery in a metaphyseal fracture of any whether you do a proximal distal tibia, proximal femur or a distal femur also. So one must know the deforming forces, what is the entry perfect point, and what is the placement of the nail in a proximal and distal segment. So differences between the proximal and distal tibia fracture, quadriceps is the deforming force and Fibula is the deforming force if it is fractured below 7 to 8 centimeter from the tibial plapon. 
it's because uh, this uh, ankle joint it's because at around 6 to 7 cm the intracellular membrane ends and there is no stability to the uh, distal uh, distal fibula except this in desmosis and if it that is also ruptured then it's become a, a floating fragment so differences between the proximal and distal tibia to get a good result entry point is a crucial in proximal tibia to avoid the deformity in a proximal tibia and a centro center position of the nail is an important in a distal tibia these are the two things are very very important it is because if you translate your entry point two to three millimeter or four millimeter also, it is going to produce a vulgus or varus deformity. It is mostly a vulgus deformity and a procurvatum. Whereas in a distal tibia, a slightest centralization is defected. The entry, uh, this placement of the nail, it will produce a vulgus or varus deformity and mostly it is a vulgus deformity in the distal tibia. So this is most important entry point in a proximal tibia and a placement of a nail in a distal tibia. With this view all, then if you want to so to be accurate with the entry point, with the placement of the nail, with the reduction possibilities, maintenance of reduction and imaging is very very difficult whatever you use i have tried all methods and i have all attachment with the fracture table and that all plastic and everything but we have to we have to manipulate the fracture we have to change the position to see in the image and during that period the fracture get displaced so therefore it is a routine thing that the nailing in hyperflexion Imaging is very difficult and we have to change the position of the CRM number of times and as well as the position of the limb. Ultimate result, malalignment, instability and failure. So for the namesake, we have done the nailing and pick the fracture, but ultimately not you are not going to suffer, but that the patient is going to suffer because of your malposition, mal reduction and placement of the nail in a very uh, fussy position. To overcome the deformity of the proximal and distal tibial fracture, then what is the solution? Solution is only two methods. The tornadoid method of open orthotomy and a high entry point, and that is in a semi-extended position, that is one, our second position is a suprapatellar kneeling in a semi-extended position by close method. And with the adjuvant clamps, polar screws to reduce and stabilize the fracture. And you can also reduce the fracture by uh, external fixators. You can also use a small plate on the medial side mostly to reduce the fracture and to keep the position. So, what is the concern? The retropatellar, suprapatellar, transcardriceps fracture. This is the retro suprapatellar transcardriceps approach. And there is always a concern to the injury to the trochlea, which is described in the literature. And it is in the everybody's mind. And that was an issue there. It's because, because of the, it was because of the with the modern development of metallurgy that probably and metal and technology that issue is now resolved. And previous reported incidence of cartilage damage was near about 16% in cases. But now with the recent development of metallurgy and technique of doing an ease of doing a surgery, now on the cadaveric study, it has been seen that it is hardly two to three percent and that too, it is like a minor average and like a lesion seen in the chondral region. Suppose <coughs> there is a concern. Dr. Garigone, Dr. Garigone. Yes, sir. Can you please uh, explain to us how does the metallurgy has changed? Because, which is, the, because the, the, the trocar, which was previously 
it was a uh, it was a very on the blunt and it was not smooth going inside and tapered at the end and therefore it was giving a same effect as it is so therefore what happens there was a abrasions at the trochanteric area but with the smooth entry and the tapering at the lower end at the distal end and because of there is a smooth passage of that trochar and therefore the entry of that uh, is smooth and therefore the trochlear uh, this uh, concern is not there second now there is a modification in the technique that we first previously it was balatability was not very much uh, uh, given importance now the balatability has given very much importance because we have to see the balatability of the patella and whether there is a free patellar floating after putting the fluid inside and then and then a supra patellar nailing should be done and the passage of your uh, this uh, uh, this uh, that sleeve should go very very smoothly if at all if you get a resistance and you are not able to pass that better to change the position or you have to open it all remove the adhesions free the adhesions and then clear the passage and then put the nail so there are now the newer techniques has come and therefore the trochlear injury incidence has become less and people are also become more and more wiser so this is a indigenously made nail probably i have worked on this for this last 5 to 6 years i first developed a very small proximal tibial nail and then i converted it into long proximal tibial nail this is a supra patellar nail aim of presentation to describe a simple method of supra patellar nailing it's a very cost effective and a very simplified method what are the indications proximal and distal tibial shaft fractures segmental fracture poor skin condition over the patellar tendon and all indications of conventional infra patellar nailing so this is the instrumentation you can see here there are in the proximal tibia there are four holes two mediolator and two oblique one at the 45 and other at the 60 degree so these are the four and distally there are three locking screws there are two mediolateral and one antero posterior so it is mostly for the distal tibial fractures it is the trochar you can see and this is the long sleeve it's a very smooth sleeve and you can see here how the guide wire is passed through that because of the tapering end through the that and this is the c arm for this and this is the j the only there is a difference between the infra patellar nailing jig and supra patellar nailing jig is a it is a longer jig because it has to go underneath the patella at the supra patellar uh, supra patellar level at least 1 or 2 cm above that and this is how the nail is assembled and uh, this the, proximally it is a locking through the jig locking through the jig and you can see here this is the assembly it's a very simple assembly and uh, after this uh, but only one thing is required that is the one flexible long reamers are required that is the most important thing because the normally the uh, and this is the semi extended position the multi knock nail to be used in the supra patellar nailing booster under the knee to maintain the 15 to 20 degrees so that if you pass a nail it will go straight with the legs so and this is the uh, you can see this is the surface working it is also the most important you must ascertain where are the bony landmarks you can see this is the supra patellar area then this is the patellar marking in supra patellar area then we have to mark the fracture site and uh, this is the neck of the fibula is also very important i will tell you why this is also important and uh, you must certain the reduction before making the um, uh, entry point for the nail or start the surgery so this is the surface marking you may do it under tourniquet or it is not necessary i do it under tourniquet but tourniquet 
it avoids the bleeding into the knee joint and this is the most important step which i do it therefore i said that the marking of the fibular head is very important a tin man pin introduction and that is about the fracture near the neck anterior two third and posterior one third junction of the anterior two third and posterior one third and this is you can say a portal it helps in the manipulation of the fracture you can do a medial rotation lateral rotation you can align the fracture with the distal fragment and it also helps in directing the trajectory now this is the inflation of the knee joint with near about i do a 30 ml saline and i must test before doing a surgery whether the patella is moving or the knee joint or not that is most important so you must see the balletability this is how it is and it is mobile and if it is not mobile give a incision put a finger inside break all the adhesions and then you pass the uh, now this is the incision 2 cm vertical incision through the cordyceps 1 cm proximal to the upper pole of the patella because 1 cm proximal to the upper of patella it align with the upper part of the tibia and then after this it should be possible to run a finger easily underneath the patella and into the knee joint that is the most important so again you can see here how i do it i give a small incision and then the, then you pass this trochea so you can pass the this is the jig is passed and you can see here and then along with the trocar we have to pass so with the trocar it is very easy for passing the sleeve and you can also mark exactly where the entry point entry point is medial to the lateral tibial spine and upper part of the proximal tibia non articular antero posterior pin for direction if there is a rheumatic canal and you feel that there may be a translation of the guide wire and nail then you can block one more screw antero posteriorly so that uh, your direction of your rimmer and guide wire will be in the center so this is how it is so this is the position of this uh, pin and you can direct it properly after this except of the trocar with the guide pin sleeve and guide pin introduction so already you have marked the entry point and this is 3 mm guide pin you just negotiate underneath this and uh, uh, across the fracture side above the this is the stinman pin so that the, your guide wire remains anteriorly and in the midline so this is the most important and then you do a proximal entry rim with a 13 mm proximal rimmer and this is also very important because the proximal diameter of the nail is 13 mm so this is actually 13.5 mm and uh, this is the proximal rimming near about 6 cm rimming is done and there is a stopper so it cannot go beyond that and after this we have to exchange the Uh, this is trocar and exchange with the long guide wire and that the guide wire this is the exchange of a guide wire and the guide wire will go till end into the metaphyseal area and it should go to the upper part of the uh, upper part of the uh, ankle joint so this is how we you have to clamp the fracture most important is the loss of reduction should not be there during the passing and you can see here this is the stinman pin this is the passage of a guide wire and then you have to do a proximal lock ribbing with a rigid rimmer why rigid rimmer proximal till the fracture lies good because it should not form a false passage that is most important so that if you do a proximal rimming with a with a uh, your uh, hand rimmer and then rest of the rimming is done by a serial rimming of the canal 
with a flexible reamer and they are very long reamer. So you can see here how the fracture is there. You have to keep your hand to stabilize the fragment and then how it is introduction of the nail and the introduction of the nail lastly. And then you can see here how it has gone. And lastly, you may have to give some blows so that the placement of the nail is exactly at the upper part of the tibia. K-wire marking for accurate placement is most important and then we have to do, I do a first oblique locking to prevent a translation of the nail into medial lateral position and then I do a medial locking. So these are all three to four locking. You can do two medial lateral, two <coughs> uh, oblique at 45 and 60 degree. First I do it from the medial to lateral side and then lateral to medial side and then to medial to lateral side, mostly it accommodates near about 30 to 32 for a medial lateral and for oblique screw it requires near about 50. So this is about the distal locking and then we have to do a give a compression and do a distal locking. <clears throat> so this is how it is, a distal locking is done. Insert two to three screw to, for the distal fracture if possible and then removal of the jig and then this is after removing the jig. If you require placement of the polar screw, you can replace with the another screw and mostly it is in a, in a osteoporotic bone. So it is, does require some time. So you have a four screw and this is five screw in a osteoporotic bone. Remove the jig. And the most important step here is <clears throat> wash the joint with this line so that all debris, whatever it is collected, inside the joint that must be washed. This is the most important step we have to do it. <clears throat> and then this is a minimal invasive surgery mostly. And uh, you can get away with all soft tissues also. <clears throat> and you can see here how uh, beautifully this surgery is done. So before the end of the operation, it is important to flush the knee joint carefully of a blood and debris minimal invasive surgery. There are two, three incision. CR position easy to execute during proximal and distal locking <coughs> without changing the position of the fracture. So this is the very important. You can change anyway the CR, but not the, the reduction manual. So high proximal tibial fractures, supraportalar so nailing, low tibial fractures, this is a diaphyseal fracture. This is three years follow of radiological union. So I have used now in all varieties of fracture, proximal, distal, segmental. And I think to my mind, it is a best method of doing a surgery by minimum invasive surgery. In comparison with the plate, there is a still some inferior in some of the aspect of a complete perfect anatomical restoration is only possible by plate. Some malalignment is possible with the nailing even after doing a very good surgery or so, but that is in acceptable limits. So these are so many other examples. You can see here how perfect anatomical restoration and function. Comminated distal TBL fracture, it is one of the best methods which I can see here how the soft tissue is there, clamp persisted reduction, no change of position, just give a calcaneal peel, give a traction to the limb for a distal area and then do a surgery. I use a calcaneal pin and polar screws to centralize the nail. That is the most important in a distal TBL fracture. I do use nail or plate for a distal TBL fracture if at all it is required. So this is the summary of a segmental fracture, how it is to be done. The issue with the soft tissue reduction while nailing, clamp the reduction, judice is the clamp and polar plane. You can see here, this is the fracture temporarily fixed with the K-wire. This is a distal because minimally displaced and this was clamped. And you can see here how segmental fracture, suprapatellar approach, ease of performing the surgery and in a distal locking, as I said, you must see varus and vulgus. That is most important point to be considered 
in an unstable distal tibial fracture. In that case, if you find some differences there, then can, you can use a judicious use of a polar screw on medial or lateral side, which will translate your nail into medial or lateral side and prevent a vulgus or varus deformity. A proximal tibial fracture, we have to wait for 10, 15 days, still he is not fit for surgery. So optimization of reduction and fixation by close tunneling, bypassing the zone of a soft tissue insert, operative steps, close nailing, and you can see here how ultimately the fracture is uh, managed. The approach allows for an easy reduction of challenging fracture of the proximal third and multiple fractures of the tibia. Facilitated an easy check of axial position of the extremity in CR. The functional results of knee joints are comparable to those achieved with improper nailing. And this is a 2018 article. Now many more articles are coming up and it becomes a more and more popular method, a suprapatellar nailing. Probably, I think in India, we are the first to start the suprapatellar nailing in an Indian version. In conclusion, suprapatellar approach, shorter fluoroscopy time, less knee pain, better functional recovery, more accurate fracture reduction, no increased risk of post-operative complication but more randomized control trials are required for further research. This is another a paper in March 2018 in the International Journal of Surgery, a very reputed journal. And he also said that it scores over the infrapatellar nailing. And the, what is the more concern is the knee pain, which is less in a suprapatellar approach as compared to the infrapatellar approach. So there are two, three reasons are given. That is the maceration of the infrapatellar tendon. There is injury to the infrapatellar branch of the nerve. And there are so many other things that the micro fractures at the tip of the upper end of the, around the suprapatellar, uh, infrapatellar tendon insertion. So these are the things all are avoided. And if at all, if you are not able to negotiate the nail and not able to perform a surgery, Straightway, you go for a, some other method like a plating or a external fixator. So it is not that when you take a patient for a suprapatellar nailing that 100% you are going to do it. Sometimes you may fail it. And probably as an orthopedic surgeon, we must convert our mind on the table that this is not a manageable case by suprapatellar approach. So probably it needs something different. So, up till now, I must have done now more than 60 cases. <clears throat> All varieties of fractures I have done it. Proximal, segmental, distal, tibia, supraperitoneal approach. <clears throat> Only two cases they went into non-union. One is required a bone grafting. Two required a dynamization. And one requ requires a bone grafting. Patient is eight to come. Probably he will come. So my results, probably they are better than the plating, but infection rate is a concern even in the suprapatellar approach also. There are one or two cases required to remove a screws uh, loosening. That was the problem because of infection. So in comparison of suprapatellar and infrapatellar, I am nailing for tibial fractures. Suprapatellar IM nailing could significantly reduce total blood loss, post-operative knee pain and fluoroscotopic time compared to the infrapatellar approach. An improved liaison knee scores and high quality RCTs were still required for further investigation. So that is the fallacy of all literature because if you will find when you see the conclusion and summary and discussion of all papers, it is Guma Pira ke wohi rehta hai. The conclusion is more or same. And therefore, there is no point in discussing all this newer publication. When you do it yourself, khud anubhav leo aur batao kaun si cheez achi hai. 
मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि सुपरा पटेलर नेल इज बेटर इन माई हैंड देन द इन प्रोपर्टेलर नेल रिगार्डिंग प्लेटिंग आई स्टिल लव टू डू ए प्लेटिंग बिकॉज इट लुक्स एक्सलेंट ऑन एक्स रे एंड यू ऑल्सो गेट द प्लेजर ऑफ स्क्रूइंग टीबीआर थैंक यू वेरी मच सो एडवांटेजेस एज आई सेड दीज आर ऑल एंड टेक होम मेसेज proximal and distal tibia fracture may result in a reduction that is unacceptable to the both surgeon and to the patient so be careful if it is unacceptable by one method of anything nail or plate please combine it again or do it in next method be careful attention to detail this fracture can be managed with intramodular nails but that is not mandatory Suprapatellar nailing scores over the intrapatellar nail. Suprapatellar nailing is an increasing accepted technique in the management of tibial fractures in the recent literature. Thank you very much. Daddy, only if I can ask you the question. Yes, sir. <coughs> Proximal tibia, no dispute. Proximal tibia, suprapatellar nail. is the best available but now you are talking about it for a mid shaft tibia and the distal tibia also you feel the suprapatellar nail is superior to the intrapatellar nail in only my confine only confine yourself to mid shaft tibia and lower third tibia the mid shaft the intrapatellar aperture still a gold standard there is no doubt about it for infrapatellar approach for a distal tibia there is still concern and to tell you very frankly sir the suprapatellar nailing was first described not for proximal tibia but first literature if you find it is for the distal tibia so when i went into the literature and found that why not to do and perform a surgery in a distal tibia and i found myself as a practical man that it helps me in many front uh, in uh, executing the surgery but if you ask as a literature wise and the majority consensus infrapatellar nailing still scores in the mid diaphyseal fracture but i am very much now convinced myself and i will take time to convince you other people also that suprapatellar nailing can work in all types of fracture if you done if it is done it very correctly No, I think take the card. I think your wording are guarded. My question is: Is suprapatellar nailing in a mid shaft tibia and the lower third tibia better than infrapatellar nailing? Because you are used to suprapatellar. Yes, but literature doesn't you, you, support. No, 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 no. I am asking you. You are used to suprapatellar. Yes, you, sir. You you go on doing suprapatellar all the time. Yes, sir. But for the other people, whether for the mid shaft and lower third, also suprapatellar is better than the um, intrapatellar. It is my experience, but literature doesn't support that. Can I ask the other faculty, Sangeet? <clears throat> Sir, uh, apart from like he has made it very clear that it is the ease and the position for distal locking is better in the suprapatellar. <clears throat> that is the only advantage. but if you are doing it on a uh, traction table where you have kept the knee in flexion you can have a uh, equal ease in locking the distal short segment second or on a modified table or a modified support uh, knee ankle support even in that you will get the same advantage apart from that there is no i don't think there in uh, there is any other advantage and there are two other things uh, dr gadigone has suggested or shown in those open fractures also what is the risk when you are doing it in a open fracture where you know like it's a, any compound wound had a has a potential of a infection since the bone has come out and gone inside and you are opening the knee joint you are going through the knee joint so the risk of that compound wound contaminating the Knee is very high. I don't do it in a compound fracture, sir. But you have shown case, sir. That is a, that is a soft tissue compromise and a blisters. 
<clears throat> it's a closed compartment, not an open so, injury like this. And I don't. So we, so we take your word. Wait, then you are not. You are not very keen to do it in a compound fracture. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Very good, very good. Yes, Dr. Chando, what is your view on <clears throat> shaft and lower one third? Oh. Gadi Gune, sir, I have been observing your results very closely since last so many years. And I saw all of your results of infrapatellar nailing to be same as suprapatellar nailing. So why have you actually shifted? Is it is it a number, new is it number number he wants? <laughs> so basically, your results were excellent even with the infrapatellar approach. This this is a political uh, answer. <laughs> Uh, really, yes. his results of K wiring for interarticular distal radius are also superb. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, nobody else anyway, can copy that. But, but <laughs> anyway, if, if I can ask you, Chando, yeah, for a mid shaft and the lower one third, what approach you take? Infrapatellar. Infrapatellar. So, so the and one same, philosophy, one philosophy sorry, always. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah, one philosophy always worries me. We are managing tibia. And why do we uh, involve a joint also because, uh, for that? So, so exactly that. Since decades, we have been doing it. Decades. And, with and consistent good results. Yeah, And I saw Gadi Gone sir giving very excellent results with proximal tibia nailing in intrapatellar approach also. And um, you had no, no problems at that moment also because your skills of reduction are excellent. Your positioning is excellent. Your pointed clamp holding the reduction and then putting the guide wire is excellent. Your guide wire positioning in the distal is excellent. Your reaming long reamers, stable reamers are excellent. So with this infrapatellar, your result would be same as suprapatellar nearly, is what my premise is. Yes, sir, I have got it uh, done with infrapatellar for an upper third, four years follow. Compound. Right. That, that is our basically. Just, just, just a minute, just a minute. Yeah. It has been shown very well that with infrapatellar, intraarticular approach, with the polar screws, malunion incidence in an infrapatellar approach is higher than the suprapatellar approach. Do you all agree, Kino? Agreed. Proximal tibia. Yes. Yes, yes, Dr. Sanyet. Sir. <coughs> The only drawback is what is happening behind the patella, we have no idea. No, 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 no. Eight seconds, eight seconds. Uh, eight problem. seconds. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not debating that. I am debating the results of infrapatellar nailing with all the polar screws and intraarticular approach are inferior to suprapatellar nailing as far as the tibia is concerned. Tibia mal reduction is concerned. As far as the mal reduction is concerned. Yeah. Do you feel Agreed. that way or no? But I, I entirely I entirely agree with you that you are invading the knee joint, whether that is good or bad, that's a different issue altogether. Okay. <coughs> yes, only, yes, Sangeet. Sir, the only thing was earlier the struggle for reducing uh, the proximal tibia was much more, which has reduced with the suprapatellar uh, nailing. That is that is the only difference. But at the same time. Uh, you know, like uh, I have done enough suprapatellar nails. What is happening is uh, what is going on inside behind the patella, what is happening inside the knee joint, we have no idea. There's no control. Even though we push, put the sleeves, the tube and everything, we are reaming through that. But still, uh, you know, like how an infrapatellar, we have a direct vision of the entry point. Here, you don't have that. Yes. Yeah, yes, the, moment you, the, the moment you try to pass the trocar, the fluid comes out. So the balloting goes away. The of that, the is, that, goes is, away. that is, sir, for only testing the balletability. What you can do another trick, you just take a towel clip and put it at the kineta over the top of the patella and just lift it up. There is no problem about it. It is just a 2 to 30 ml saline needs to discuss to see whether the patella is moving or not. After giving initials, everything is going to come out. There is no issue about it. So now, now if his question, if we try to tease out a little, you have inflated it, you have introduced the jig, you have introduced the nail, I mean, the, the reamer and all. But now, patella is not bloated. Now the patella is flat because the fluid has come out. 
it harm? Does it harm the patella or the artery? No, no, artery? no. It does not harm. It is a so smooth structure, sir. It is a. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, we are since you have done a good amount of work. We take your word, and we are only asking you. And uh, sir, we are only asking. Uh, sir, your point. I will explain it better way. Please, please. The supra patellar nailing is establish its place in a proximal tibial. Exactly. Exactly. I am not disputing that at all. Ah. Uh, then I am not disputing that at all. Other question is for diaphyseal fracture. I frankly uh, disclose in front of you that it is not established its efficacy. Third, for a in uh, that distal tibial fracture. Now the new papers are coming up for distal tibial fracture. Probably within two to three years, you will get a much better data for distal tibial fracture. And I hope this also will be established in a distal tibial fracture. So, as Sangeet right. said, Sangeet said, it's correct. There is no doubt about it. But there is, if you do it, and there is some ease up. We are working only for ease up surgery. And I will keep the position in a perfect. And suppose if you can do it by suprapatellar approach, I think it is better. So nowadays, abhi sir, aisa hai ki nayi chiz hai to it takes time. English, English, English. There are few people who do not understand Hindi. So only newer thing is actually the condylar blade plate to take to digest for me it took near about thirty years. So probably for suprapatellar nailing also, probably people will take five years more. Okay. Agreed, agreed, agreed. <laughs> no, I think your point is very well taken. Uh -huh. Proximal tibia, it has improved the result. There is no issue. Mid shaft and the lower one third you mentioned about it. Hmm. So that's perfectly all right. Now we we'll have to see what is the damage to the knee joint. Uh -huh. If ever it happens, which is the one which is to be seen over the years. True. But then... It will be highly compensated by a good result of proximal tibia. We agree. Yes, Sangeet. Sir, <clears throat> there is one consistent thing which happens here is uh, when you push the guide wire in the proximal tibial canal, it tends to hit the posterior cortex and escapes through the fracture site, which, uh, you know, like earlier in an infrapatellar, when we were doing an infrapatellar nail, we could do a, a recurvatum of the proximal tibia so that that nail, uh, the guide wire is parallel to the anterior cortex. So that means here, while we are doing a suprapatellar nail, always we have to put a polar pin or a polar Stinman pin to guide the guide wire, to guide the reamer and to guide the nail. Exactly. Without that, without that which, is the drawback of this uh, approach. Without which that, he has, the, uh, which he has described it. Which yeah. he has described. Uh, uh, Sangeet, Sangeet. Without that, without uh, that, you cannot pass. Uh, and this Sangeet, is my experience. Uh, Sangeet, it is not described in the uh, literature. Actually, this was Madhip. Actually, they have said sometimes you do use a polar screw if it is going posteriorly. But in prevention, it's better than cure. Therefore, I put each and every case anterior two third and posterior one third thin one pin three mm so that it will guide me up my guide wire as well as the so if that I is not I, I i want to tell all the participants please understand we are all four of us are very close to each other and we each other we really appreciate each other's work so here what we are discussing is very very finer points with the pure your idea of really understanding the minor things about the surgery. It has nothing to do that whether we are against it or in favor of it. There is no issue about it. Then again, one point I want to mention, Sangeet. When you do a segmental fracture tibia, there is a trick of doing the surgery. So if you use an external fixator, that is a well and good for restoring the length. And if you are not doing that also, so what we have to do, we have to concentrate first on the proximal fragment only. First on the proximal fragment so that your guide wire and reamer will go in the proximal fragment smoothly without going into the spinning mechanism. And after this reduction of a proximal fragment, and then you have to concentrate on a distal fragment. So that and then clamping and then passing the guide wire in the distal. 
so proximal tibia you just cannot get the reduction at the both fracture side so if you divert your attention at the both the ends then possibly you will not be able to succeed in doing the segmental fracture uh, tibia kneeling so first concentrate on a first proximal fragment then go to a distal fragment i could not complete my point so continuing to what i have said so the uh, literature doesn't describe this putting a polar screw polar pin posteriorly to guide the wire reamer and the nail so are we wrong somewhere that we only need it and those which which have done enough abroad they are not they don't require it are you getting me what i said sir possibly sir possibly it could be instrumentation no the even with uh, the imported i have done with the imported one with the nephew is the same okay so for, when we were doing a infra patellar we could push the tibia so that our guide wire remains at parallel to the anterior cortex now here what happens is when we are doing a supra patellar the guide wire goes like this it goes like this so we have to push it anteriorly with a posterior polar stinman pin or polar screw or something there is a question in the chat availability of a long reamer for the distal tibia fractures there are i think for the for the tibia fractures i presume you are using the femur reamers they are available right? they are available with the manman there is no issue with the set they usually give it yogeshwar yeah. gives it with the set that's good actually that is i have suggested to design it in 56 cm length of this and normally we get here is the 44 to 46 cm so i have made it uh, get it done it customized so now it is available in 56 cm because maximum length of the tbi is near about uh, 40 that's all more than that it is not there and again you take five you set it to 45 the 46 to 56 is enough because you have to pass that uh, sleeve also so these are 56 there is one other question in the chat sir while inserting stinman pin proximal tibia is there any common peroneal nerve injury while crossing fibula therefore surface marking is done just to know the fibula tibia this uh, uh, neck of the fibula and uh, i don't think we have to go from not from medial to lateral side you start from the lateral side to medial side so that there is no uh, injury to the uh, nerve because you are no where you are passing it from medial to lateral side is yes, there may be some problems but not from lateral to medial pin should be passed from lateral to medial and other question is you prefer to put a polar screw as close to the fracture as possible or away from the fracture it should be if you put a near the close it may be a fracture propagation so at least there should be a near about 2 cm gap of a polar screw from the fracture side okay somebody has asked doctor uh, can you explain how do you use a polar screw Dr. Chandok, can I ask you to prepare for the polar screw, or if you have the talk, any one of you have a talk ready on a polar screw only? Then yeah, can, can you just explain that? Yeah, I can explain that. Just two minutes, I'll explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Can show Hello. a run over tibia compound fire almost fire for up uh, uh, infra patellar nailing upper third. You can do na. बता 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 हेलो सर क्वेश्चन हेलो यस सर क्वेश्चन इज टू गार्डिंग ऑन सर सर डू यू चेक एनी प्री ऑपरेटिवली वेदर देन बलो बलो डब्ल्यूडी आफ्टर इंप्लांटिंग द सलाइन दैट इज आफ्टर एनेस्थीसिया सो डू यू चेक एनीथिंग एक्स्ट्रा प्री ऑपरेटिवली बिकॉज़ सम टाइम इन पटेला फेमोरल अथर्टिस इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू मूव द पटेला वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन in that case if the patient is willing and you have explained to him that i may use a tornado approach then you can do a parapatellar incision remove the adhesion and see the upper pole of the patella upper 
upper part of the tibia that can be done suppose if you are not ever an expert mm -hmm. to that particular thing straight away go for a plating there is no issue okay sir so basically if there is an osteoarthritis of the knee you will avoid a suprapatellar navy am i right yes sir yes sir that's perfect yes i think carry on yes this uh, lady had almost 25 years of diabetes and she had a run over accident she was around 54 55 and yeah uh, this is she was run over by a bus and, and this was the skin condition she was admitted with one of my friend and he wanted me to just come and help uh, he he at first sent me the x ray and uh, what will you do for this? And then I happened to see the patient because there were some red flags and this is how the skin was. Unfortunately, the pre-op x-ray is not there, but it wasn't much. It was a straightforward, very slightly comminuted upper third tibia. We will see the intra-op images. So this is finally... Uh, I almost saw the patient first time in the theater. So this is how it was, upper third tibia. That's a synthesis ETN, reduced, locked. I think there are four or five screws in the proximal fragment and three in the distal. And all the skin around was even on the table. Whatever looked dead was removed. Borderline situations were retained. This is the wound on the opposite side, and this is the tibia nailed side. This is day three, then day five, that's on the opposite side, and this is the tibia nailed side. This is day nine. Uh, plastic surgeon, of course, helped with the cover there. The other side also, the skin by this time was dead. So this goes out. This is one month. This is 10 weeks. This is four months. This is five months, seven months. And with all that soft tissue damage there, it was virtually impossible to even think of uh, trying to graft it. Nine months. That's 11 months, and this is 13 months. This is united, and this is two and a half, and it's now almost four and a half year, five years. This is how she is. So. I don't think anything else would have allowed that fracture to heal. Asim, very good. Yes, sir. Uh, the fixation was, uh, uh, the reduction was anatomical, though it was infrapatellar. The fixation was strong enough and uh, stable enough uh, to sail through union in a difficult situation. Excellent result, Asim Bhai. Excellent. Infra Patelar. This Infra wasn't Supra Patelar. There are two, three things. Bhai, Nika Luka, Gawale Sarkar, Ola, Da Guru, Kya. So, there is a TBL slope is more. Then there is a virus uh, angulation is still there. But if you see the result of this injury, it is my, my, to me, if you ask me, I will say it is a hundred percent result. But uh, uh, we are, are wonderfully done it. <coughs> Sangeet. Yes, sir. Do you want to say something? Achha kiya hai, bahut badiya boy. Very good. Sandak, sir. Yeah. It's, uh, the success was, uh, you know, that deglobing injury. Primarily uh, excising everything so that, you know, <clears throat> uh, there is no residual infection underneath that. 
which can lead to further complications. So exercising that with the help of a plastic surgeon, covering a rotation flap, I think you have done a muscle rotation flap primarily, if I am not wrong. No, no, no. It was pure, purely a debris mass were done by us and around say day five or six, we asked him to come and help us with the skin grafting because it was massive. He took grafts from wherever he could take. It was beyond our cap capacity to take that much of graft. So it was, there was no muscle cow. All the debris mass, they were done by us and then we showed him, look, this is what it is. So he came and took graft from here, there, and all large sheets, and then meshed them. So he helped us with the cover. Similar case, I will show you next time with some very unusual methods of fixation of a degluing injury primary, with the same approach like this debridement, skin grafting, and everything, and something unusual internal fixation of a uh, complex TBL fracture. Sandak sir, chalu karo. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> I'm presenting a case first. So, nailing us. I hope you are able to see the screen. Ekdam badia. So, this is a retrieved case patient had come after uh, his initial surgeries. So, had an initial nailing and as you suggested for uh, segmental tibia, distal tibia here, proximal tibia, though the surgical execution was quite good. Any comments on this? Of course, patient had later on infection and as we can see the soft tissue, there appears to be a soft tissue insult as well. So, Possibly to me, looking at the x-ray, a very early intervention in a, a tibia which is yet to get a good soft tissue. So now, after this, I'll be showing few photos from the patient's relative's mobile. So this was the picture after the nailing. So any any so this, this case teaches us the value of soft tissue. I don't know whether the surgeon had to do a open reduction and then manage all those fragments. The incision for the nail appears here, the infrapatellar it is. Whether it was a wound uh, is not mentioned in the notes as well as the patient's relatives were not able to tell me. But as, as I see, I presume it was a large lacerated wound and a flap and a soft tissue which was not optimum for surgery. So this was the post-operative wound. So at this point of time, any suggestions? We'll make it interactive and have suggestions. Every, 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 every. So all, all would definitely agree that was. So the surgeon, these were the pictures after the debridement. And as we can see here, a nail is seen in the fragments which were removed and a wound which was getting better. So still the patient was with the previous surgeon and he had managed it with multiple surgeries and debridement. So after this, a flap or still more debridement and removal of this further necrotic bone. Sangeet, your opinion? Yes, that, uh, I would change it to a fixator, remove the nail, remove that dead bone, put a fixator, cover it with flap, Okay, uh, and then once everything is okay, then go ahead with then uh, any further thing. Segment, yeah. But segment. I, 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 I presume there is no pus except that, uh, except this uh, this wound is there. So this by this time he had received almost one and a half months of treatment and had long course of antibiotics etc. Uh, as the wound looks, there was no pus, but but patient general condition was still not better as per not the medical. Yeah, that was not still better. Sir. Yeah. Sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, take out the nail, remove all the dead bone there. Uh, hmm. We'll pack the void left over with a, a muscular type of cement, antibiotic mix, uh, block if possible, culture is available, then mix those antibiotics in the cement and use your favorite ECP. 
I'm hooked on to here. It will work very well. It will give four locking screws above and one empty one locking distal long plate. You can use a distal femur plate also, whichever side, right or left, which fits best. Uh, and uh, it will be very stable. And you will then ask your <laughs> like flat. Yes, I think I would agree with that that you need some form of external fixation to bail out, give stability, clear the infection and provide flap. Any opinion from any of the participants if you want to give any opinion? Or any? Make it interactive, no issues. If none, I'll just proceed further. So this is... I think I'll do the same. I would uh, remove the nail, yeah. dry all the bone, yeah. do an external fixator for now. Uh, cover the wound with uh, either gastro flap or even a gastro from proximal and a uh, soleus from distal. Okay. And okay. then think of uh, coming back and doing a either bone transfer. It's good to do muscale, but we don't know the rate of infection. If there is infection, I don't know if muscale will work very nice. Okay. So, two issue, two suggestions either muscale or a bone transfer. Sir, I'm. Hi. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also yeah. want to answer for the same, sir. You would also like to go ahead with the same two strategies. Either no, no, no. I I want to answer for this question, sir. Sir, actually, may in my opinion, we should remove the nail first and the dead bone. Okay. Then we should support uh, the leg with an external fixator on the opposite side and do a gra uh, a flap or a graft. What is required by a plastic surgeon. Once uh, this all part is completely healed, then we should go for the corticotomy and bone transplant, uh, bone transportation with Elisa ropes. Accepted, absolutely accepted. I think, uh, yeah, Nagesh. Sir, yeah. Sir. yeah, thank you. Uh, the, only one portion that with this type of injury, the bony injury and the soft tissue damage which we are seeing there, a local soleus, gastroc, and all those flaps. They are out because the area of uh, tissue injured is massive. So, plus it will definitely require a subsequent secondary and tertiary procedures in future. Okay. So, you ought to get a cross leg flap. That will be the ideal situation. I would agree with you with, with so much of massive infection. Local, yeah, the no local flaps. The gastrocnemius may not be available one. It could be injured too or it would devitalize further. So you, these are your concerns. So you would prefer yes. a cross leg. No flap. local flap. No local flap. I think that's a point valid. Uh, sir, Chandak, sir. Yeah. Hmm. Probably hmm. The, uh, removal of the, what you must have done it actually, I can uh, anticipate. Yeah. You must have removed everything, external locking plate, and then whack. And then probably afterwards, a, a cement spacer and flap. Yeah. So in principle, it is, as sir said, debridement, debridement, debridement. Get everything dead out, cover the soft tissues, provide a stable external fixator in any form, and then think of uh, uh, bone filling procedure, either transport or masculine, and then filling the gap. This is what I think in principle we agree. And what you suggested, Gadigone said, yes, exactly. So this was the further follow-up. And I must appreciate the patient's relative for keeping everything. These are photos taken from his mobile phone. So he provided me everything. So he was keeping track of everything. So this was again further wound. And the surgeon waited for a long time for the granulation, etc. to appear. But waiting long here in such a situation, actually the bone goes on necrotizing further. So this was not helped. And as you can see here, a lot of pus, debris, everything was there. And, and the situation was not improving. So he, he the patient still was with him. He thought of a novel idea and he converted into x -fix as was suggested. But I did not uh, understand why this philosophy he chose. He put up a fibula inside. So I, I don't think uh, this was a, a step which we would have thought of. So it was an x -fix, as was suggested by many. And as you can see, the x -fix was... Uh, not a very, very uh, great X fix. This is one pin, second pin from here and two pin here. The bone uh, stability was an issue 
and he put a fibula. He removed the fibula and then inserted fibula here. So, and that was something which did not give uh, as good a thought Chandak of. Sir, Chandak sir, you yeah, must yeah. thought only of regaining the length only just to keep it distracted with the fibular bone. That must be his idea. So that the length will be maintained and that fibula may not work. Is it the same patient? Sir? Yeah, it is the same patient. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. He, he, this is but the same. who would do a distraction with this ex normal external fixator? Ah, that is that is something which is difficult. And uh, the bone loss is proximal, and yeah. here the docking is uh, distal. So the whole he, segment is lost. Whole segment is now lost. It is, it is not matching. No, it is same. Same patient is same. Same patient because it's a long story, and all all X-rays are from his uh, mobile and everything. So this is so, uh, the amount of bone which is excised. Yeah. So he did not excise the whole bone. I'll show you the subsequent pictures. So, and, and this was his follow-up. This is not healed. So we had to excise then completely. So from that point onwards, we, we excise complete bone. This is his lower third, which was lower down. So this whole segment had got necrotic because of that. Intervention. The fibula was used was from the other side. So, this, the, what is it doing? This through? Is it the rear patient? Uh, no, it is. It is basically a, a long segment of cement. So, this segment of cement I wanted to hold in position as a cement spacer after a cross leg flap. So, this I put intramedullary cavus, which actually migrated, and this screw is just to maintain the stability of cement to the main a side fragment of bone so that the cement doesn't dangle. So it was a small screw to keep the cement spacer. It was a long cement spacer to keep it in position. And then on that, there was a, a taper pin X fix. And I find this Why such a thin cement? Okay, it is, it is a, yeah, okay, fine. Sorry. This, this, is, this is the whole cement. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the whole cement. So, and then as soon as the whole dead segment was removed, everything, uh, the soft tissues, his general condition, and he could stand and his, his ability to tolerate the further procedures improved and his psych improved a lot. So this cement, uh, as here low down was in position, but this tried to just come out, was not sticking up well. So this was then removed at around six weeks. And then... This was the amount of segment which we had to manage. This was the amount of bone graft which was needed. So we decided to get the remer yeah. irrigator, remer irrigator aspirator. So the, in this case, the challenge was the medullary cavity at the systemus was really very narrow. So we initially rimmed inside with 11 mm, 9 mm, 10 mm, 11 mm, and then used minimum available was 12 mm. So then the 12 mm remove, we got good amount of bone. So this was the ECPO, the extracutaneous plate. The traditional X fix was removed. Uh, ECPO from the medial side. This is what is extracutaneous lock plate. So advantages as compared to X fix are it is a lock construct. The pins at times get loose or get infected, but the ECPO do, uh, pins do not get infected. And I, if I can show you the clinical picture. These were the grafts from Rhea which were added. This bone was managed. This amount when we excise, this bone had a, a paprika sign which was positive. The screw size required for a MIPO or the ECPO are large. You may need 100 and 105 and 110 also because this much goes inside and then the plate you have to keep some distance so that you, uh, you are able to dress the patient. This was subsequent. Now this is what is interesting. As compared to a X6, uh, the ECPO. So you look at the large, as Dr. Negi suggested, a large cross leg flap was done for this patient, which got everything back into position. A large cross leg flap. This is ECPO. And even at eight months, nine months, one year, look at the pins. None of them get either soggy or infected because it's a locked construct. So as we have experienced, all pins with external fixator, which are very stable, uh, taper pins, a stable pin, do not get infected, especially in tibia. 
and this this he could tolerate almost for one year and look at the this is what i would like to show the uh, pins so can you see here look at the pins the threads and pins this is this is some small amount of secretion you are seeing but all other pins are absolutely fine and this is the beauty of uh, uh, this external fixator as a locked external plate or extra cutaneous plate or supra cutaneous plate there are two words in the literature which are used and he healed very nicely this is how and one advantage is this patients join back their office they put on their own trousers and hardly are noticed that they are having a external fixator and as you can see here this this patient kept on healing very well and the long segment took time to reconstitute this lower third fracture you can see is consolidated now so that fragment which you kept uh, got united the ecpo uh, functioned well even up to one year this long time of uh, fixator was required for this patient and this is after the x fix removal so this patient has done well he was really very happy at the end of uh, all this journey with x fix and uh, all those issues in spite of his large wound and everything so can i ask you question yeah please go. how where did you harvest all that graft from so this is a, a long segment yeah so this is what is a technique of uh, ria reamer irrigator aspirator so uh, okay, okay. Uh, the, the technique is known as ria r i a reamer irrigator aspirator so you are harvesting from the medullary cavity of femur and there is a special device that is known as a ria device with which you harvest it it's a uh, synthesis it's still a huge it's still a huge poison ria so it works femur please yeah, femur yeah more can, can we are talking about the bone grafting yeah. he will give a full top on a ria ria is essentially the reamers are put in the femur and whatever the ream material which is there it has been it has been it comes out so it is been used as a bone graft but he will give a wonderful talk on that and probably he is the first one in india to have that ria now there are only two or three other people in india who have this ria so we'll talk about it a little later when we are talking about bone retrieval for the yeah. graft yeah yes, sir so yeah polar screws you you yes i think but while using this extra cutaneous plate in an exfix or an elizaro we can easily easily uh, correct any mal reductions post operative here if you have got any uh, i'm not talking about gross mal reduction but some angles and other thing how do you correct that so again it becomes a procedure so uh, ideally it needs complete redo but then there are no incisions there are no opening of planes it is just changing of the screw keeping the alignment so first you align the bone whatever position you want and then accordingly put the extra cutaneous plate so it is actually complete redo but very rarely it is required because uh, on table everything is open so wherever we are using it there are all cases where it is either infected non union or there is a problem where it is not a close procedure per se so your reduction uh, one person would be keeping the reduction and then you put the trajectory of screw which keeps it reduced then it is no problem i'm just question here where to make a incision for a grafting after the heel of leg flap so yeah so, yeah very interesting question so initially in the initial phase after my registrarship and all we always wondered and kept on asking the plastic surgeon do we give the incision at the edge of the uh, flap or the middle of flap or the other edge of the flap the proximal edge where the circulation was and plastic surgeon always asked us to give it into the center they said because the circulation is now derived from all the ends circumferentially you can incise it safely in the center for tibia i would incise in the shin area in the center part of the tibia that is where i would incise so once the flap is matured then you can incise anywhere there is no problem like any other skin which you cut yeah you can cut 
Have you ever faced problem of the cold welding while removing the CPO? Never ever. Because so, you are using a you are using a stainless steel basically. Yeah, it is basically stainless steel. Number one, number two. Even if it happens, I can imagine that situation that one of the screws is not coming out. So remove rest of the screws and then then use the plate as a lever to remove the last uh, badma screw or the last uh, culprit screw. Very good, Dandak sir. Yeah. Is there any roll up uh, portable um, this color Doppler study while? Uh, uh, testing the circulation of the flap and to plan an incision in the center or periphery because nowadays <laughs> all plastic surgeons they do have a, a portable uh, color doppler so is there any role of that color doppler uh, so, so what you are uh, surgery during giving uh, before giving incision yeah. what you are talking about is a handheld doppler machine yes so, yeah we have it in our theater the value of that doppler is for arteries with up to 2 mm of caliber. So it cannot detect micro arterioles and it cannot detect the flow in them. So the best best available thing is to test with the fingertip pressure onto the skin whether it has got circulation. It doesn't give the value of arterial circulation of the flap. It doesn't give. That handheld Doppler is useful when he is trying to find out a fibor, uh, fibular perforator which is around 8 centimeter above the tip of lead oh. yeah. whether that is intact or not that decides for them whether he can do a local flap for an ankle defect yes. and your question is concerned we are usually requested ki we should enter only after two months yes between two to three months that flap has matured enough wherever you want to cut you can cut it yes, safely I like to lift the margin like a half window, open the thing, do my work and put that cover again. So I don't cut it in between. I go at the margin, which is stitched. Right. Good. We need something to the plastic surgeon then. No, but his job is over. Once he does the flap one hour and he goes away, he pockets his money, and some amount and he goes away, <laughs> then it's our headache. <laughs> Sangeet, do you want to show any case, Sangeet? Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, the question was, so how long did you wait? How long did you wait? Minimum two months. So weight bearing, yeah, so weight bearing on this ECPO is immediate. And that is the beauty of this procedure. Since all construct okay. is blocked, full complete weight bearing with a walker, with, with any part, uh, sort of support, so that that minimizes the pain. And these patients are functional. They are even driving their vehicle. They are going to their offices. So all patients are ECPO, whether with large fragment. After graft or before graft? Even before graft, even after graft. Even with a uh, large gap in between, they walk because there is a cement spacer. Andak, sir, I, have, I am trying in two patients or I am very grateful to you after showing your uh, that uh, external fixator. I did it in two cases and uh, their patient is happy and I am also happy. Yeah. Yeah, That's it's wonderful. Yeah, they are really thank Dr. Chandak. I am also hooked on. Have, have you paid a royalty to Chandak? Yes. <laughs> you paid royalty to Chandak? <laughs> so his royalty was because uh, I have never used initially in humorous. He suggested that in humorous also it works very well. I use it in humorous. Yes, so I, I listened to that and then I've used in humorous also. That has also given good. Paranthu, humorous me chalu karte karte radial nerve jana ni chahiye. It's a nerve ka lapda hai. Yeah, yeah. It's an open procedure, sir. It's an open procedure. You are seeing the things you are putting there. Sangeet, you are sharing screen? Okay, Sangeet. Last case before we close down. Yeah. So this was a 40 year old gentleman. He had this uh, proximal TBL fracture and that was a nature of wound. Uh, those were his x-rays at that time. Uh, <clears throat> there is a combination in the proximal third of tibia and presuming that the wound was clean because he had come just in six or eight hours, 
so we nailed him uh, by a infra patelar uh, nailing now any comments on this this was done about 7 or 8 years back uh, what we had done was we have fixed with a 3.5 lakh screws here the oblique proximal tbl fractures and then used a uh, a nail which had a provision of four screws uh, two in a oblique direction and two from medial to lateral and distally again three screws should i go ahead yes yes <laughs> one of these fractures so, is going to give trouble yes because it is in varus if you can see here yes. even though in lateral the reduction looks good but in ap there is some amount of varus and the problem now here was with his wound even though we have successfully done it close but uh, the wound progress like this to uh, in uh, where we had to debride it again but still it was not healthy and uh, patient was advised at that time to for a full debridement wherein we go ahead again and have a look of the implant whether to remove it but he said no i don't want to do that or probably i was not able to convince him so he started having a discharging sinus and subsequently uh, it all settled here there was no inflammation esr crp was normal but his x ray was uh, not looking good even though there was some callus formation in the distal fracture proximally everything has resolved on the medial side and there was a large defect here and uh, the area the part of the bone from which we have passed the interfrac screw probably there you see a lysis and that part of the bone has necrosed so this is my own case so we re removed the nail we excised everything which was appearing dead there was no infection and we put a lateral plate and for the defect we used a ipsilateral uh, opposite side uh, fibula here that was his wound and this is his intraoperative picture where uh, apart from the fibular graft we added cancellous graft auto cancellous graft on the medial side a single lateral plate that is his post op where we are able to correct the varus of the proximal tibia the fibula is intramedullary and there was some mobility in the distal uh, tibia but we didn't do anything except compressing it uh, to the best possibility and this is how it progressed at the end of 6 months and in about 2 uh, years this is how it looked like this is his leg which is absolutely normal uh, a solid union and the fibular graft getting incorporated and even the distal segmental fracture has united wonderful wonderful sangeet <laughs> but sangeet what will the philosophy behind using a intramedullary fibula here the defect basically i didn't wanted to use a second plate on the medial side because there was a flap and i didn't wanted to dissect it away from the bone completely so you wanted that it is the internal split which is giving yes. internal support yes. so instead of a second plate i added a fibula you added it should should i stop sharing yes. there is a question how uh, uh, sangeet uh, plating was done so, sangeet my question was actually we have discussed uh, initially also with the uh, tanna sir and chandak sir ki uh, we are sometimes very uh, very fast decision makers for, for doing any internal fixation in a such a segmental fracture and you also know that as a very senior person that there is some problems when there is a segmental fracture and which uh, is there is there is a disaster which has happened in my hands mm. uh, uh, similar to dr chandak sir what he has shown and uh, the only thing is what you are saying is it elaborates 
all what has happened if you can allow me to share that uh, yes yes you can probably it will help everybody actually there are so many compulsions of the patient as well as patient's relative and also we think that patient may go away from us to somebody else because of delay in surgery but that should not dictate the uh, proper protocol of uh, managing the uh, this is this type of a very uh, complex injury so this was a young 34 years old gentleman who had sustained a road traffic accident uh, in october 2009 and his wound was uh, 3a open wound he also had other uh, so that was his wound at that time and uh, uh, in a hurry as you said dr Ch gadi gones sir i nailed him uh, this is uh, a nail which was available at that time which had a provision of four proximal and four distal screws and uh, you can see the amount of comminution it has uh, exactly like uh, dr chandak sir's case the wound i thought was clean there is no problem i gave a lavage debrided it and ho i hope everything will settle down but the behavior of the wound was on subsequent follow up was not good there was redness see pain severe pain fever and then eventually this is how it was looking and it started necrosing uh and this is what it was at two weeks where the complete skin which was uh, in between the open wounds uh, has necrosed there is a this is how it looks and then sub uh after excising that dead skin this is what was underneath all the fragments were loose they were dead they didn't had any vascularity and you can see the color of those fragments which was not acceptable so we removed everything which was up loose which was dead and even here that white thing it was removed and he had a frank infection at that time my mistake was uh, i underestimated the soft tissue damage which usually occurs when we have such uh, bad crushed or badly segmental fractures so going ahead i should have used a fixator rather than using a internal implant the course would have been different it's a more aggressive treatment at and the decision and a wrong decision taken at that time the uh, this is how it was where he had a 14 cm bone loss this was a wound Uh, the implant was exposed so along with the plastic surgeon uh, we decided to remove the implant clean the medullary canal clean the wound and give him a micro uh, free microvascular free flap and with a fix we removed the implant put him on a external fixator and this is how a free flap was given and uh, that was taken up very well and once everything was okay after 5 months uh, we removed the fixator now here the issue was lengthening 14 cm so uh, we did a segment transport over a nail after a holiday period of about 3 weeks for the pin tracks to heal and once we ensured there is no infection we went ahead uh, by using a calculated nail which had a provision of three locking holes uh, used a ring fixator over a nail to transport a segment from the proximal tibia after doing a corticotomy and that is how it progressed and once the transport was over we locked the transporting segment to the nail with the help of a locking screws and then we removed the fixator so this was all done in 5 months time and subsequently this is how uh, the regenerate started to consolidate 
at nine months, and uh, he had uh, uh, not a complete union at the docking site. So we added some cancellous bone by a small incision to enhance the healing. And then at one year, everything has started consolidating. This is uh, after about two years, and this is his function. This is the area from where we have taken a free flap, and he has a full function, but he has an ugly looking leg with that hypertrophic uh, flap. And this is uh, after the nail was removed at the end of four years. So one decision, one wrong decision at that time, probably uh, he had to suffer for four years and uh, it was all the decision at that time. Sangeet, Sangeet, at the time of nail removal, you could ask plastic surgeon to debulk that flap. They can make it uh, cosmetically more appealing. He said ugly legs. So at the time of nail removal, you are already doing a procedure. They can was not it cosmetically. He was not bothered. Yeah. But but the good part is he has remained with me for four years. We yeah. tend to be very kind to these patients if they are loyal. Exactly. I am grateful for we, to him for that. We, yeah, we, we, we are extra courteous to them. Somebody had asked... Uh, so realize that he has not gone away. <laughs> regarding the polar screw, uh, uh, if sir permits two or three slides, uh, can we? Yeah. yeah. So this is a famous uh, presentation and the uh, uh, journal presentation. So a medial starting point in a proximal tibia fracture. So this experiment I liked. To me, I think this is from Torneta only. So yeah. if, if you, you are. I am not recollecting the name. So. <laughs> This is a critic, uh, critic, critic, critic. Okay. Ah, critic, critic. Is sure about the presentation. So, if you are having a medial entry in a proximal tibia, this is what happens, and this is what the usual problem is. And I have faced it n number of times that the proximal fragment then goes forward; it it goes uh, away. Same thing if you just take a lateral entry to the lateral tibial spine. That is actually the medial edge of the lateral tibial spine. This, this usually does not happen. So this is one which I like. So this is where the entry point. So most of us either would take a centromedullary pin. So the lateral tibial spine is the best entry point. Two or three things uh, why Tornata suggested this in an extended position is then you are shifting the patella more medially and you are more axial and you are more anterior into the, into the things. So when to use polar screw and how to use a polar screw? This diagram is from one of the Indian uh, uh, presentations. And then he said the use of the reverse rule of thumb technique. And that is the best guide where a polar screw is needed. And, and this picture I have pasted in the theater also. It's a fantastic picture. So reverse rule of thumb, where you put your thumb and you feel that it is going to correct the deformity, opposite to that is the polar screw. So if this is the deformity in your nail, so you have put a nail and your nail has gone like this. So where are you going to put the uh, polar screw? So this diagram amply clearly suggests where you are going to put the polar screw. So this is a typical position which happens. So imagine on the X-ray, where you are going to do the reverse rule of thumb and, and a good picture would help you out. So this, this was fantastic. I hope everyone is able to see this. So for a proximal tibia like this, for a tibia which is oblique in this fashion, and, and this is where the polar screws were put medially. So this, this diagram is very, very clear where to use the polar screw. The logic behind the use of polar screw there are three important logics is to either change the guide wire position 
or to reduce the width of the medullary canal, to block the nail and increase the mechanical stiffness of bone implant construct. And I think most of us have used polar screw for these three important principles, either to change the trajectory of the nail, to block the width at particular point, to make the medullary cavity less uh, wider and increase the mechanical stiffness of the bone and implant construct. The problem with low Herzog band is that it translates and therefore the high Herzog band came into being. So usually this is 90% of the proximal tibia nailing. How hard you try, many of the times we used to get this and that is what I was interested in Gadegonesar's previous nailings and in current nailings also. This was not happening. So this was not happening because he was using a clamp and an interior entry or a higher entry point. So all the 10 principles, the tornita is given for proximal tibia nailing. Even if you try some of the patient may still have those problems. And this is another uh, use of polar screw, how to use it. Find adjunctive technique in nailing pro um, proximal tibia. So if the proximal tibia is going into this position, the higher entry point is used and, and where to use the polar screws. And this, this diagram, another diagram which is very useful is, sorry. So you block the posterior part so that you are guiding uh, glided in the anterior part. So you create a channel reamer parallel to this and then goes anteriorly. So you have blocked the posterior part. So this is the logic of polar screw, how to use it. Gadi sir gave a very clear indication that anterior two third and posterior one third. So you are you are going to into the anterior one third of the proximal tibia. You may put it here. You may put it here also. It should be as as anterior as possible. And when the tibia shifts into either varus or valgus. So again, think of the reverse rule of thumb. So here the reverse rule of thumb would be I will be holding it in this position. Use it where the reverse rule of thumb. Remember that reverse rule of thumb copy paste it in your theater and then we are able to decide where the polar screw has to be used so i, I think that for the what... benefit of all can you post that diagram in, in the, the group yes i'll group? post yeah i'll yes. post yeah sure that's all for i think today and uh, so of... there is a newer study now may i say or not a presentation but overall so yeah yeah please can... some questions there are some questions from the crowd yeah uh, time you should have waited to go ahead with definitive fixation. The question is for me, I think. Three weeks now, uh, as you told. Uh, from Nitish Kohli. Uh, Nitish, are you there? This question yes, is sir. very interesting. Yes, Once yes, we get prospectively, uh, in the case which I had presented, second case. He has asked me how much time should I have waited to go ahead with definitive fixation. Uh, anybody wants to answer? What is the ideal time? So actually, uh, long-standing cases at least three weeks gap should be the one. And if you recently it is only a ten days, it's sufficient. Even people give it twenty-four hours window or so. If it is very recently for. Seven days or eight days are there. So it depends on the uh, the potential of infection and everything. But <coughs> for a, uh, um, in my view, it is 10 to 15 days for uh, if it is less than uh, one or two months, and if it is more than three months, probably it should be for three weeks. So 10 to 12, uh, so uniformly like 10 to 14 days should be ideal. <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Mustafa Khanbai has asked, how do you convince the patient to still be with the surgeon? Once you get a complication, do you have, uh, do you do any concession on your fees? Oh, actually, this is a, this should be in the, in the end of this uh, uh, course, uh, uh, how successful is the practice to do? Uh, oh, webinar <laughs> yeah, probably at the end we will have one, one part. Sangeet, the rules are different for Chandak Sab and Gadigone and you and because we do 
on no, the no, place. No, to, to answer him, I have not charged him after the complication. Uh, Only yeah. the hospital expenses, nor his visit fees, not even his dressing charges. Uh, in my clinic, when he had come for follow-ups for all those three and a half years. I, I think when we have a complication, uh, we we are uh, really not worried about anything except getting a good result. Yes. So yes. nothing matters to us for that patient. It is the good result. Ultimately, we should bail him out. Uh, rather, we give, we 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 subsidize him for his antibiotics. Also, we call our representative friends that give him some samples. Antibiotics yeah. samples. So help him in whatever way. Um, um, we have to, it is our moral duty to help him out, and eh? that is that should be our philosophy. And sir, his other part of the question was how he stays with you. So he stays with me because I give him a clear cut path to recovery that this is what is likely to happen even before. Suppose this patient, uh, Sangeet. Says, so on day zero also, we have, uh, without bothering that he may run away from us, we have told him that, look, in a compound fracture, so many percent will get infected. So prior to starting the treatment also, we have counseled him enough. He is aware that all these things can happen. So it doesn't come to him as a shock that something uh, wrong has been done. Plus, so to recovery also, we speak with a lot of clarity and uh, confidence that look, these are the patients who have become all right. We can show him the this, yeah. And then having we are that, efforts to help him. Having so had that said, complication, having had that complication, you have to be very straight and explain him. This is what has happened. Yeah. This is the future. A clarity word, what you have yeah. used. And second thing is they require time, which we don't give. Yeah. So they require much more time to explain what is happening and usually uh, we don't give that and that is why they get irritated and they go elsewhere. And I have got one big advantage, Javed Bhai and me, we are fairly senior, very good name and so you can always in, fall back on your colleague who has got a big name and uh, senior, who is senior, who is having a good reputation. So. Patient can be seen by him also. He will just um, maybe rattle out the same thing but or give inputs. But that Im improves the confidence of the patient that now two well-known, good yes, yes. people are saying the same thing. After looking he, after. Uh, yeah, look, he stays with you. You do the donkey work. So it's 10.45. We have answered all the questions. Uh, time to say bye-bye. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you all. So we close today's uh, webinar then. Sangeet, yes, sir. Sir, वो ये मोहे का वो registration डाल देना ना वो faculty में include किया है. Yeah, 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 yeah. ठीक है, ठीक है. मैंने उसको बोल दिया कर दी कर दो. Yes, yes, is done already. Good night, sir. Good night, good night, everyone. Good night, sir. Good night. अरे वो Sangeet sir. Yes, sir. वो मैंने के प्रेजेंटेशन शेयर किया था देखा क्या नहीं आई हैव कम लेट सो आई हैव नॉट ओपन इट टुमारो मॉर्निंग आई विल गिव अ फीडबैक ठीक है ठीक है वो कैसे डालने का है और एक दो राइट राइट ओके ओके गुड नाइट सर